Good evening, YouTube. My name is Alan, and it's that time once again. Let's talk metal. Tonight, we're going to do a run through the discography of one of the really great power metal bands of the past 20 years. And we're going to be talking about Florida's Camelot. Now, something I'll touch on right up front here. Camelot is not your traditional 80s style power metal band. This is not a band that's like Omen or Savage Grace or something like that. They're also not one of the speed metal power metal type bands such as Gamma Ray, Iron Savior, Halloween. Uh, they don't fall into that category. But they're also not one of the really completely Euro power metal sounding bands either. You know, they don't quite fit into the Stradivarius Rhapsody camp of power metal either. Camelot kind of has their own thing going on. It's not going to be for everybody. You know, if you don't like any power metal recorded after Keeper of the Seven Keys Part 1, well, Camelot is probably not going to sway you back into the power metal camp. If, however, you like a lot of power metal that's come out in the past couple of decades, Camelot might be for you, but it does have its own take on the genre, which we're going to be talking about some tonight. It's one of the reasons I think the band has been very successful and has a very strong following. For me personally, I always think of power metal bands in terms of decades. You know, for each decade, there tends to be one particular power metal band that I feel was at the forefront of the genre. In the 1980s, for me, it was Halloween. They practically invented power metal or helped reinvent it as you got into the Keeper of the Seven Keys era towards the late 1980s. When you get into the 1990s, Halloween kind of you know, went down a different path for a while, and it was Blind Guardian who kind of took that torch and carried it forward with a run of incredible albums. You could also assign the 1990s to Running Wild, I think, although Running Wild had been a lot more established through the 1980s as well. If I have a default answer, the power metal band of the 1990s was very much Blind Guardian. But when you get to the first decade of the 21st century, Blind Guardian kind of slowed way down and started putting out some albums that were not up to par with their previous output. And it was this band right here, Florida's very own Camelot, who would carry the power metal torch for the next decade. The fact that Camelot's from Florida is a little unusual in the first place. Florida is a location we associate with death metal for the most part. However, there have been traditional and power metal bands from the Florida area in the past. Two of the big ones, of course, were Nasty Savage and Sabotage. But in more recent years, you've had other power metal bands from the Sunshine State also. The excellent Seven Kingdoms is a good example. They play a style that's very reminiscent of classic Blind Guardian power metal. And then right in the middle of the whole shebang, you had this band called Camelot. Camelot was founded by uh, the main man, <clears throat> Thomas Youngblood on guitar. And there were some other things that were sort of unusual about Camelot right from the start. Not only did you have a power metal band from Florida, you had a power metal band from the United States dead in the center of the 1990s, which is a time where power metal was extremely unpopular and overlooked in this country. It has still had a good following in Europe, Japan, other locations overseas, but you couldn't give power metal away in the United States in the mid of the 1990s. So, you know, Youngblood had his work cut out from, for him, trying to play this style of heavy metal in this particular location where, yeah, not at all the sound people were looking for at that time or that place. Another thing that made Camelot a little unusual is that they ended up being picked up by Germany's noise records. And noise, of course, is one of the classic heavy metal labels and has had a lot of good power metal on it, such as Gamma Ray and Halloween. But Noise very rarely signed any American bands. You know, they only had a few bands from North America, period, over the years. Voivod being you know, the obvious one that most people will think of right away. But Noise didn't tend to pick up a lot of U.S. acts. And so it was kind of interesting, and I think fortuitous for both of them, that Camelot was able to hook up with Noise Records. I know in the um, Noise Records book published a few years ago called Damn the Machine, 
uh, Carl Walterbach from Noise Records commented that you know early on he was pretty impressed with Thomas Youngblood's vision for the project and his work ethic. That Thomas had a very clear idea of what he wanted to do with this band, where he wanted it to go, what it want, what he wanted it to look like, and Carl had a long history of appreciating bands that came to the table with those kind of things in mind. That they had a very distinct identity, a visual aspect they wanted to cultivate. And, you know, sort of a game plan, you know, what the long term goals for the band were. And so I guess it worked out because Noise picked them up and started releasing Camelot Records around 1995. Their first one was called Eternity, shown here. It establishes some norms for Camelot. The purple and gold color scheme got used quite a bit, especially in the early years. The you know, sort of, you know, regalia with the coat of arms and the crest and such. Uh, yep, which you'd kind of maybe expect for a band going by the name Camelot. The second album came out pretty quick after this. It's 1996's Dominion. And I'm kind of lumping these two albums together because this was the original lineup of the band with uh, Mark Vanderbilt on vocals and Rick Warner on drums. I saw stuff about this band circulating in the mid 1990s, probably in places like Sentinel Steel magazine. And it sounded interesting, something I wanted to check out. And I did get a hold of at least one of these albums, maybe both of them, right there around. It was probably early to mid 1997 by the time I ended up getting them. I think, interestingly enough, my mom found them at a record show. She'd gone to like a record show with my dad, who's a record collector, found these. Uh, I don't know if she remembered the name as something I had mentioned or just thought, no, yeah, that looks like something the boy would listen to. But regardless, she picked them up and sent them to me just as a blind surprise care package in the mail, which was very cool, along with some Blind Guardian CDs too. Thanks, mom. <sighs> So I was very interested to check the band out, but to be honest, these first two Camelot albums are pretty mediocre. There's no real standout tracks. I've gone back and revisited them in later years, given them another chance, and they've never really caught my attention. And to be honest, I don't think there's a lot of fans that get into these two albums very much. Yeah, the songwriting is still developing. It's not terrible, but... Um, it just doesn't sound like it's quite matured enough yet. And uh, you know, not to harsh on the guy, but Mark Vanderbilt's vocals seem um, like they don't quite have the range or the sonic capabilities to help elevate this style of music to the next level. It seems a little monotone. And just doesn't really have what you were looking for in a power metal vocalist. So, yeah, I checked him out. I was like, well, it's very cool to hear them, but yeah, nothing too impressive here. And so I kind of tuned out on Camelot. It's like, yeah, this is not a band I want to follow up on. While I was away, a few interesting things happened. I think um, Youngblood must have also realized that the band was not gaining much traction with these first couple of albums. And so some lineup changes were in order. Uh, Warner on drums and Vanderbilt on vocals were out, and Youngblood seriously upped the ante, bringing in two very, very talented replacements. On drums, he brought in Casey Grillo, who was one of these sort of child prodigies who started playing drums like in third grade, and even you know, as a teenager was already playing with national recording acts and such. Casey's a very, very good drummer, very technical, very precise. Uh, you know, he can play fast and such when he needs to, but he's very good at doing uh, very nice, intricate drum work that still fits within the framework of the song. He's not going to dominate and play lead drums all the time, but you definitely will notice his presence behind the kit. And that's exactly what I think makes him a really outstanding drummer. They don't take over the band, but they definitely help elevate what's going on behind the scenes. So uh, Casey was in, I think I've heard that Casey had worked with at least one metal band before this, but digging through his bio and such before making the video, I couldn't find references 
to what the band name was. So uh, perhaps I'm wrong and he was not in a band before this one. The other change that was just as important was that Thomas Youngblood brought in Roy Kahn on vocals. And Roy had sang with the Norwegian sort of progressive slash power metal band Conception, who had done a few records on noise by this point. Uh, Conception had a pretty airy kind of sound. They were definitely on the lighter side of things. Uh, if you're looking for a reference point, maybe something like early Angra might be compatible with the Conception sound. Good albums, interesting albums. I really like the second and third ones in particular, Parallel Minds and In Your Multitudes. And Roy's vocals are amazing. He's one of my favorite vocalists in heavy metal. He's got a very smooth delivery. He can sound very warm. He can also sound very sad, a little melancholy when he wants to. A very rich, very textured voice. But again, without being over the top or anything like that. Uh, Roy is shown there on the picture, third from the left. And so with this revamped lineup, it was still Thomas and original bassist Glenn Berry. Uh, they went back into the studio for album number three, which is called Siege Perilous. And it would come out in 1998. This album again... Uh, now, I did not hear this album when it came out. I was completely checked out of the Camelot camp. I've heard it since then, and it's not bad, but you can tell the new lineup is still working out the kinks. They're um, working on how they're all going to fit together, what kind of songs are going to work best for this group. Uh, so it's an okay album. It's a little boring. It definitely isn't quite there yet but it has the potential with this lineup, something good can happen. And it wouldn't take much longer for them to really find their niche. That happened on album number four that came out in 1999 called, appropriately, The Fourth Legacy. On this album, the band also hooked up with the production team of uh, Sasha Payeth and Miro. Sasha had been one of the guitarists in Heaven's Gate, a uh, very good and overlooked German power metal band, had done some excellent albums in the 1990s. They eventually kind of got a little weirder and a little more outside of heavy metal before uh, grinding to a halt. But Sasha and um, partner Miro had done a lot of really good production jobs on albums over the years. And Thomas brought them in on this album. And it definitely helps. You can still tell there's a big jump in sonic quality compared to the previous albums here. And this is the album where things really click and take off. This is also where I got back onto the Camelot train. I remembered when the album came out, I'd seen it in the record store. I paid no attention to it because I'd already heard two albums by this band and wasn't interested. But then I saw that it got a review in Metal Maniacs around the time. I'm pretty sure it was Matt Johnson who reviewed it. Apologies if I've got that wrong. I did not dig up the original review, but Matt gave it a short but very positive review in Metal Maniacs, mentioning that, yeah, it's you know, a really fantastic slice of European flavored power metal. And oh, by the way, they've got you know Roy Kahn from Conception is in fine form on vocals. And that was one of those wait, what moments for me? They've got who on vocals now? Oh, I stopped paying attention at the wrong time. Uh, I went back to the record store the next day. They still had it. And I picked it up and instantly blown away. This is a fantastic album uh, in that style. And this is, again, very akin to a European power metal album. It's uh, much stronger, tighter songwriting than what came before it. A little different than what's going to come after it, too. Uh, but the album is chock full of highlights. Let's look at the track list for a minute here. Uh, Fourth Legacy is exactly what you want in your big sort of galloping European power metal anthem. Silent Goddess is very good. Uh, Desert Rain leads into Knights of Arabia, which is a little slower mid-tempo song, as you might expect from the title. It's got a little bit of an uh, Eastern, Middle Eastern vibe to it. Uh, you have Shadow of Uthar is just divine, galloping, catchy uh, power metal par excellence. Uh, Sailor Man's Hymn is more of an acoustic ballad, and it's absolutely beautiful. This is the kind of song where Roy's voice can just do wonders for a song. It's the kind of song that a lot of people 
typically might not want. It's it's the ballad on the Paramental album. Oh, geez. Oh, this song can make you cry. It's just beautifully done. Um, and there's lots of other ones on here are good too. Alexandria is pretty cool. And Two Kingdom Come is pretty good. Closer Lunar Sanctum has a little different vibe to it. Casey Grillo really gets to show off some cool drum work in the background of this track. It's a mid-tempo one. It's a little moodier, uh, just a little bit slower, but uh, works very well. Roy's very sensuous vocals over the top of it. Uh, excellent, excellent album, start to finish. And it's showing off that, again, the band can write top-notch material, not just playing, you know, full-out galloping power metal, not just, you know, sappy ballad, acoustic -y stuff. Um, they've got songs all over the map on this album. Each song has its own speed, its own identity, its own story, and they almost all work incredibly well. So, yeah, Camelot, an excellent release. A little overlooked at the time, 1999. Now, by this point, power metal was back with a vengeance. You had Hammerfall and Rhapsody had done big things to put power metal back on the map over the previous couple of years. In 1999, you saw releases like Blind Guardians, Nightfall, and Middle Earth that, uh, again, really blew away a lot of power metal fans. It was sort of their watershed moment. So, you know, Stradivarius had become very popular by then and was getting a ton of recognition. You know, so Camelot, you know, hit at the right time in a way. They put out their strongest album yet, right when a lot of people were starting to pay attention to power metal again. But it was also quickly becoming a bit of a crowded scene. But Camelot would fight through it and carve out their own niche. Uh, in 2000, they did a live album to sort of keep the momentum going. Uh, this one, I've heard it before. It's fine. It's got a pretty good track list to it. I was not blown away by it. It's it's a live album. Um, you know, live albums often have to be very strong to impress me. Um, I don't mind them, but if it's just you know a random set of live songs, it's probably not something I go back and play an awful lot. But you know this kept the band's name right out front, and would see them transition right on into 2001 with their next album, which is called Karma. And here we are hitting prime Camelot. Uh, this is the era of Camelot now. After 1999, again, Blind Guardian would kind of go radio silent for a few years and come back with a very sort of long and overdone album eventually. It took several years to get Night of the Opera out and it wasn't the best um, it, was, it was the first time Blind Guardian had taken a step down in terms of quality. Camelot, in the meantime, was going from strength to strength, heading into the 2000s. Karma picks right up where Fourth Legacy left off. But here the band is starting to develop a little more of a unique visual identity. This is where you start to get a little bit more of a gothic look. Um, while it might sound a tad bit ridiculous, it wouldn't be a stretch to call Camelot starting at this point sort of, you know, gothic, romantic, dark power metal. If that's a micro, infra, sub, sub, sub genre, I don't know, so be it. But it does kind of tell you what you're getting in for. You know, the guys are wearing a lot more black, sort of, you know, the you know PVC wet black leather look, um, you know, you know, beards getting a little more braided, hair definitely dyed a little darker, maybe. Um, themes getting, you know, a little bit more into that gothic romantic territory. For example, there's a trilogy on here about Elizabeth Bathory um, going over that story once again. Regardless of the sort of shift in image, the band is absolutely killing it in terms of music. Uh, the album starts off with the amazing forever. This is exactly how you want every power metal album to start out. Just strong, pretty fast, anthemic, catchy. Everything is firing here just fine. Wings of Despair lets Roy just soar on the vocals. Uh, just perfect control of his voice, hits it perfectly. Uh, and you've got, you know, the ballad at track five, Don't You Cry. But again, Roy can put so much passion and emotion into that kind of song that you don't mind them. They don't come across as contrived or sappy. Now, again, if you're somebody who just hates power metal ballads, okay, you're probably not going to like this one either. But if you ever were going to like one, uh, Roy Khan's probably the guy to sing it to you. 
The title track, Karma, is brilliant. Uh, once again, it's just flawless power metal. You've got other great tracks, The Light I Shine on You, A Temple of Gold is good, Across the Highlands has a great soaring epic sweep to it. Um, you've got two back-to-back, -back, just A-plus caliber albums here. So the band has found their lane and they're going to seize on this opportunity going forward. Right, same lineup is back in 2003 for the album Epica. Epica definitely sees the band playing more into that sort of dark gothic image. Now, again, the music is not going into goth music territory. This is still very much the power metal genre that they've carved out for themselves. It's just that in terms of lyrical concepts and imagery, they're adopting more and more of this sort of, you know, yeah, dark, brooding, melancholy thing going on. Epica, the album, um, I don't know if it's the entire album or just most of the album, but uh, there's a concept story going on here about uh, there's a character called Faust. There's devils and angels, some of whom are fallen and some of whom aren't. Again, all of this really, really plays into that gothic angle that uh, Thomas wanted to cultivate with the band. And they do it incredibly well. Um, the songs on here are great. The opener double check in the title here so i don't get things tripped up center of the universe once again just amazing blazing perfect power metal opening track for an album that the band knows how to stitch these albums together perfectly by this point uh farewell has that big uh hands in the air sing-along vibe to it You've got Wander is really pretty. At the Edge of Paradise is beautiful. Once again, Khan just showing off why he's one of the best vocalists with one of the best voices uh, from this era. Uh, when you get into the story songs, they're still good. Um, it's, the story starts to take over a little bit at time. You start to have some more spoken passages with, you know, different people doing voices for different characters, you know, this angel versus that angel. And, so on it's not bad but you get a little you're starting to get just a little overwrought maybe in parts of the album but still uh, it's a very strong album it's maybe a step lower than the previous two but it's very very close um let's see some presses have a bonus track called snow which uh, again is just a flat out european power metal speed burner but very catchy very pretty perfect track uh, really glad I've got that particular version because, yeah, it's a fantastic song. Bonus tracks a lot of times are not a, a absolute, you know, pristine song that you must have. And a lot of times, you know, it's an extra cover song or a remake of an old song, something like that. Uh, the bonus track, Snow, from Epica, is one of their finest. Uh, it's... <laughs> If you don't have it on anything, it is one of those rare occasions where it's worth tracking down a version that includes the bonus track, Snow. All right, and just a side note here. This album is the place where the European power metal band Epica got their name from. Um, Epica's had a long run, pretty successful career. Their vocalist, Simone Simmons, shown in the center there, would end up doing some guest vocals with Camelot on their next album. And their next album is the one that really sees Camelot at their peak. And this is the Black Halo from 2005. This is the album that really got the band a much larger fan base than what they'd had before. Again, they've been putting out very good albums, uh, three in a row at this point. But this album got much wider acclaim and it also got noticed by a larger group of fans. One thing that helped here a bit, around 2005, this is where YouTube was gaining in popularity quite a bit. It was becoming you know, more of a regular pastime to check and see what's been posted on YouTube. And the band wisely capitalized on this with music videos, which of course, MTV and such was not a thing by 2005. Music videos still get made, but you know, Camelot made sure they did uh, good videos and got them into YouTube circulation. 
so that people could hear the music, but also see the strong visual presentation they were going for. Once again, playing very heavily into this sort of, you know, I wear black on the outside because I am black on the inside type gothic vibe, but in a very pretty and ornate way, like with the cover art there, which is pretty eye-catching. The album has a great track list once again. They've got some guest vocals, as I mentioned. Opener March of Mephisto is a little bit of a strange song. It's kind of slower and heavier. Um, it's got a, kind of almost a jagged edge to it. And again, there's sort of a little bit of, again, going back to the Faust and Mephisto uh, well, once again here. The vocals, the demonic vocals for the Mephisto character are done by Shagrath from Demo Borgir. Then you go into the excellent When the Lights Are Down, chugging full speed ahead power metal uh you get into uh the haunting somewhere in time uh amazing track with roy and simone simmons kind of trading off on lead vocals uh, it was one of the highlights for the album really got um, a lot of folks just blown away by that particular song soul society is very good as you go down through the second half it, it backs off just a little bit in terms of quality. The album's a little front loaded in my opinion. That would be the one knack or sorry, the one knock I'd have against it if I had to complain about something. But still, excellent album. The band has done four, you know, A level albums in a row here. The first half of this decade, they could do no wrong. And this album sold incredibly well. Uh, and again, really helped establish a larger and wider fan base for the group. All right, they would make sure to capitalize on this with the release in 2006 of a live set called One Cold Winter's Night. This was also put out as a DVD, and it's a good concert. It's a very good set of songs. They look good. They sound good. Once again, I don't consider it a masterpiece of a live album, but it shows the band at the height of their powers. Really, what more could you want? Uh, it's very well done front to finish. It again, <laughs> sold very well. Uh, people were very high on Camelot at this point in time and deservedly so. The, the, the band was delivering winner after winner after winner at this point. All right, so after the live set, they would come right back in 2007 with their next album called Ghost Opera. Same lineup, although they've added a uh, keyboardist to the band roster this time. They'd had a keyboardist on the first three albums and had then been operating as a four piece on those last four classic albums. Here, keyboardist is back in as a full time member. Ah. Uh, this, for me, is where Camelot starts to overdo it a bit, though. The album artwork in particular, I didn't think was nearly as good as any of their more recent ones. This, this The style of art is, uh, I don't know, it's not as detailed, it's not as rich. And I don't know, the songs on this one, none of them really blow me away at all. And... It's not a bad album. They were doing the same things. They still have the same visual aspects going on with this sort of dark gothic power metal. You know, they made sure they had videos out um, on YouTube to help drum up interest and hype for the album. And yeah, the songs aren't bad, but none of them on here really impressed me either. You know, if I was making my own personal best of Camelot playlist compilation, I honestly don't know what I would take from this album. Um, there's even one or two songs. I'm looking at the track list, trying to remember which one it is. I feel like there's one or two where they sort of do a little bit of like vocal distortion effects on Roy's voice, which always confused me. I'm just like, no, 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 no. Uh, you, you know, when you have a vocalist that strong, you don't need these gimmicky devices to make his voice sound all weird and electronically. No, 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 no. But when you have the Mona Lisa, you don't start, you know, scribbling over it with Crayolas trying to do some touch-ups. Fuck that. No, not at all. So yeah, this one for me was a miss. You know, the album sold very well. It was, you know, still popular with fans. But for me personally, I just felt like, yeah, um, 
just kind of misses the mark a little bit. This is an album I rarely revisit, and when I do, it's kind of like, well, it's all right, but uh, it doesn't hold a candle to what they had done over the previous eight years or so. It's, after this, uh, it'll be a little bit longer. You'll notice the bands had stuff coming out, you know, year after year after year, pretty consistently. But then there would be a three-year absence. The band, of course, was still playing live and making videos and stuff like that. But you wouldn't get a new studio album until 2010 when this one came out called Poetry for the Poisoned. Uh, things going on here. Now, you know, Noise Records is long since a thing of the past. And they'd also already gone through, let's see, the last couple of albums, I believe, were SPV, Steam Hammer releases. And then on this one, they're on a different label again, more of a, uh, I don't know if it's a social release thing. It just says, yeah, Camelot Media Group. So sort of odd that the band is having some issues staying on the label. Maybe they just weren't happy with the deal from SPV. I've never heard any details about why they left. Um, the artwork here, once again, is showing that they're sticking to that, you know, yeah, the dark gothic kind of thing. Um, personally, I'm not a fan of this piece of art. I, once again, I feel like they're overdoing it at this point. Uh, instead of, you know, playing into sort of that more gothic romantic, here it's just kind of gothic and a little effed up looking. It's like, um, this is more dark creepy rather than dark warm power romantic stuff. Hey. So yeah, well, weird piece of art. And this one again, the track list, it's better than the previous album, um, but not by a lot. There's one track in particular on here called Hunter's, uh, let me get it right, Hunter Season. This is a sublime track that could have been on any of those four albums they had in a row that just knocked it out of the park. The rest of this album is um, more average. There's a couple of others that aren't bad, but once again, nothing that really blows me away. So now it seems like, you know, Camelot has kind of stalled out a bit. And one thing that's happening around this time is there is turmoil in the lineup for the first time in a decade. Um, Roy Kahn would leave the band and that's, of course, a huge hole to fill in this lineup. Uh, Khan was a huge part of their sound and their success over the past 10 years. So the band was going to have to get someone new to sing. Uh, my wife and I saw them play around, live around this time in Atlanta. And they didn't have a replacement vocalist at the time. They were actually sort of having... Uh, different people fill in on different songs as sort of like, you know, uh, all our friends are going to sort of chip in and help out on vocals a bit. It, it was still an okay kind of fun show to watch, but yeah, it really hurt that we just missed uh, getting to see Khan live, because as I said, one of my favorite vocalists of all time. So when you lose one of the best vocalists of all time, you better get a new vocalist who's pretty damn good. And to Youngblood's credit, they went out and found a pretty damn good vocalist. They recruited this guy, Tommy Kervik, who was working with the Swedish power metal band Seventh Wonder. Seventh Wonder had been on the scene for a few years before this. They are considered more of a progressive power metal band. They're closer to the Dream Theater camp but they really straddled the line quite nicely. They've got the progressive leanings of a dream theater or uh, maybe say a royal hunt, but they keep the song structures pretty close to more traditional European power metal standards uh, than dream theater does. So they work there pretty well in that space. And Tommy has an incredibly good voice for that style of music. Good singer, good range, uh, very clear, very emotive, uh, works quite well. That's him in the center of the picture here. I had seen Seventh Wonder play at Prague Power in Atlanta. I think they played there twice in the late 2000s. I saw them the second time. They had done a concept album that was very well received among paramental fans. It's called Mercy Falls, kind of a very complicated story of someone in a coma and uh, a kid and um, yeah, weird love story gone wrong. 
but really good album. They had followed it up with an album called The Great Escape right around 2010 or 2011. That was also extremely good. So yeah, Seventh Wonder was a known quantity, and Tommy Karavik was a known quantity as a very good vocalist. And as such, Youngblood offered him the spot in Camelot, which Tommy took up. This was not the end of Seventh Wonder, but it definitely put that band on the back burner, which is a real shame. They had done several excellent albums. To my knowledge, they've only done one in the past 10 years called Tiara. Good album, another concept album, this one about aliens taking over the earth and humanity trying to find a way to sort of uh, free themselves. Um, good album, has some excellent songs on it. Kind of a shame that Seventh Wonder got sidelined with uh, Tommy working with Camelot. So they would put Tommy to work and come out with the first album with the new vocalist in 2012. This one's called Silver Thorn. All the visual aspects are remaining the same here. Um, but there's... Um, and Tommy works well on this album. His voice is different from Khan's. You know, while he's got a good power metal voice, he doesn't have quite the same you know, textures to his voice when it comes to singing the more melancholy or you know, dark or brooding thing. Khan does that as well as anybody. Tommy's fine at it, but it, it, it is different. Nevertheless, he sounds good here. He fits in. You know, he gets gets the black clothes and you know changes the facial hair a little bit and all that kind of stuff to make sure he's got the look. Uh, and Silver Thorn, it's a pretty good album. I think if nothing else, it did allay fears from the fan base that Camelot might be done for, that they couldn't bounce back and do something without Roy. It's like no, 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 we're we're good. In case you haven't heard this guy sing with Seventh Wonder before check this out and folks are like okay yeah that that works pretty good can't can't complain about that can't say there's a ton of standout songs looking over this year but it's not bad falling like the fahrenheit is really good tommy gets to show off uh, some very nice vocal melodies on that ashes to ashes i remember liking um yeah some of the others are good uh the video debut was for a track called sacrimony or Sarcrimony. It's in a funny script. I didn't think it was one of the stronger tracks from the album, so I was a little surprised they used it as the lead video to introduce the new lineup, but it went over fine and did okay. So Silverthorn, it did its job. It kept Camelot going, showed that, yeah, the band was still going to work, and that even though changes had occurred, it, it wasn't the end of the world. All right. A few years later, they would come out with their next album called Haven, and this one very much follows suit from what they were doing on Silverthorn. And if anything, I think at this point, you start to see the band, I hesitate to say they're in a rut, because that has kind of a negative connotation that maybe they're not doing things very well. Everything here still sounds excellent, but the albums are starting to feel a little more samey compared to one another at this point. So Haven, another pretty good album. Got it as soon as it came out, played it a lot when I got it. Songs like Fallen Star, pretty good. They still have the weird sort of creepy uh, song with Citizen Zero. They have at least one of those on every album, it seems. Uh, Liar Liar is a better, faster number on here. Um, but yeah, Here's to the Fall isn't bad, as I recall. It kind of feels like they're just, yeah, sort of... You know, they've got their thing pinned down and they're not deviating from that formula much anymore. And at this point, they've done the formula enough where it's, it seems to be that they're having a hard time writing tracks that are going to really blow you away. It's like everything is good, but nothing is really great. Um, and this trend would continue into their next album, The Shadow Theory, released in 2018. Now, on this one, drummer Casey Grillo had left the band. He had ended up taking over the drum kit for Queensryche at this point. So you have a new drummer in. Uh, there had been one other lineup change I forgot to mention at some point. Original bassist Glenn Barry had been replaced by Sean Tibbetts, uh, but the band had you know, persevered through that uh, with no issues. Both of them were good uh, bass players for the band. 
The shadow theory does everything that the previous two albums have done. You know, Tommy still sounds absolutely fine doing this kind of material. These songs are good. Looking over the track list, um, is there anything I think of as amazing? Uh, not necessarily. It's a good album. It's just not a really excellent album. So, you know, while the, the first decade in the 2000s, that was the age of Camelot. The second decade, you know, they've kept things going. They've made good albums. These have not been terrible albums in any way, but they're, they're not breaking any new ground and they're not recapturing the heights they were at around, you know, 2001, 2003, 2005 era. This is the last studio album from Camelot to date. So we're in 2022 at the time of this recording. Definitely time for something else to come out. Schedules, of course, have been thrown all akimbo thanks to the COVID pandemic. The band did get yet another live album out in 2020 called I Am The Empire. This one I have not heard. It's the only thing in the Camelot catalog I've never heard. It came out pretty late in 2020, and of course, by that time, the world was very preoccupied with other things going on. So I completely missed that this had even been released. Um, looking at the track list, this one is very heavy on songs from the Kervik era of the band, which makes sense. He's been in the band for three albums now, and so you know, there's still going to be a couple of mainstay classic tracks from older albums. But it makes sense. This is going to highlight a lot of the newer stuff that they've been doing over the past 10 years. So it'll be interesting to check this out. I'll give it a spin sometime, maybe while I'm putting together the thumbnail and uploading this particular video. But yeah, nothing I can really say about it at this point, except for this is where Camelot stands at this point. Um, there was another lineup change here, I noticed. The drummer they brought in to replace Casey on the Shadow Theory is not the same drummer credited on I Am the Empire. So I don't know if Casey's departure meant they had to fill someone in last second, if they're still just looking for a uh, full time long term replacement. Not sure what the status there is. And that is the story of Camelot. It's a band that, yeah, had an amazing run of four albums that are, you know, at the top of the genre, you know, like a lot of other bands, you know, after that, they cooled off a bit, but they have found their lane. They've got their niche with this sort of, you know, gothic dark take on power metal that suits them pretty well. They still have their fan base and it'll be interesting to see where they go from here. I do wish, of course, like most fans that they could get another album that would be really top notch, another, you know, Black Halo, not a Black Halo part two. We all know how part two albums tend to go. Let's let, let's not take that particular route of desperation and do it that style. But it would be cool to hear them come out with something on par with Epica or Karma once again. In the meantime, I'm content picking up the albums that they've done in recent years. I'll admit they're not albums I go back and revisit very much, though. Silverthorn, Shadow Theory, Haven. I play them a bunch when I get them. I'm like, yeah, pretty solid, pretty good. But once they get on the shelf, they don't tend to come off the shelf very often. So here's hoping that in the near future, we get a, another Camelot album. And this will be one that will spend a lot more time in the CD player, and less time collecting dust on the shelf. So that's the end of my take on Camelot. Now let's talk metal in the comments down below. What do you think of Camelot? Are you familiar with this band? Has anything here tempted you to go check them out? Uh, what are some of your favorite songs and favorite tracks if you're really into the group? You know, Roy Khan left the band in part over sort of becoming born again. There were some religious things going on there. He has since reunited with Conception and they have new material out that I have not heard but uh, some folks have said it's pretty good. Other folks have said they didn't like it as much. What do you think of the new conception material? Should I check it out right away? Should I just wait and get around to it whenever I get around to it? Leave a comment down below. Let me know what you think of Camelot and their kind of unique gothic infused style of 21st century power metal. Okay, with that, let's wrap this one up. Until next time, everybody stay safe. And as always, keep banging your head.